Our text this morning comes from Ecclesiastes chapter 5, beginning in verse 8. Ecclesiastes 5, verse 8. If you see in a province the oppression of the poor and the violation of justice and righteousness, don't be amazed at the matter. For the high official is watched by a higher, and there are yet higher ones over them. But this is gain for a land in every way, a king committed to cultivated fields. But he who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This also is vanity. When goods increase, they increase who eat them. And what advantage has their owner but to see them with his eyes? Sweet is the sleep of a laborer, whether he eats little or much, but the full stomach of the rich will not let him sleep. There is a grievous evil that I have seen under the sun. The riches were kept by their owner to his hurt, and those riches were lost in a bad venture. And he is father of a son, but he has nothing in his hand. As he came from his mother's womb, he shall go again, naked as he came, and shall take nothing for his toil that he may carry away in his hand. This also is a grievous evil. Just as he came, so shall he go. And what gain is there to him who toils for the wind? Moreover, all his days he eats in darkness, in much vexation and sickness and anger, Behold, I've seen to be, what I have seen to be good and fitting is to eat and drink and find enjoyment in all the toil with which one toils under the sun the few days of his life that God has given him. For this is his lot. Everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them and to accept his lot and rejoice in his toil. This is the gift of God. For he will not much remember the days of his life, because God keeps him occupied with the joys of his heart. There is an evil that I have seen under the sun. It lies heavy on mankind. A man to whom God gives wealth, possessions, and honor, so that he lacks nothing of all he desires. Yet God does not give him the power to enjoy them. But a stranger enjoys them. This is vanity. It's a grievous evil. If a man fathers a hundred children and lives many years so that the days of his years are many, but his soul is not satisfied with life's good things, and also he has no burial, I say that a stillborn child is better off than he. For it comes in vanity and goes in darkness, and in darkness its name is covered. Moreover, it is not seen the sun or known anything, yet it finds rest rather than he. Even though he should live a thousand years twice over, yet enjoy no good, do not all go to the one place. All the toil of man is for his mouth, yet his appetite is not satisfied. For what advantage has the wise man over the fool? And what does the poor man have who knows how to conduct himself before the living? Better is the sight of the eyes than the wandering of the appetite. This also is vanity and a striving after wind. Let us pray. Righteous Heavenly Father, thank you for blessing us with this word from your servant, the King Solomon, uh, the preacher, the teacher. We pray, Father, that you help us to heed these words, that we might live this life according to what you have given us, and not expect things out of this life that this life cannot give us, but that you alone can give us, and that alone through your Son. Help us, Father, to have our priorities set according to your will and your ways according to the wisdom that you have delivered to us through your Son and through his apostles. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. 
All right, if you are visiting with us this morning, I just want you to know that it is, it's our M.O. To, uh, to study through whole books. Uh, we, we don't do a whole lot of topical uh, preaching around here. We do mostly textual studies. Uh, and that's why we're in Ecclesiastes 5 and 6 today. This was not my choice for a, a weird Father's Day passage. But I wanted to read the passage first and let you squirm a little bit. Um, we could, I suppose, twist this into a Father's Day passage, but we're not going to. In Ecclesiastes, we, we keep coming back around to this idea that the good for man is to eat and drink and enjoy your labor. Maybe there's a suitable Father's Day message in that. Solomon repeats it yet again in our reading today. In fact, it's, it's basically the heart of our reading today. Behold, I have seen what I have seen to be good and fitting is to eat and drink and find enjoyment in all the toil with which one toils under the sun the few days of his life that God has given him, for this is his lot. But we've seen before in this book how, how this position that God has given us in life can go awry. And Solomon has a, another warning to add to that, a pretty basic one at that, that riches will not fill the ultimate emptiness that he has been talking about in this book. Everything, as he has said from the very beginning, everything is but a breath. What our English translations usually render vanity or futility or meaninglessness. Everything that there is, is a breath. All right, we're like a vapor, here today and gone tomorrow. And it's not just us, it's everything. And riches won't fix that, won't fill that, won't make any of the rest of this any more substantial because these riches themselves are no more substantial than any of the other things that we've been talking about in Ecclesiastes. And so our work and our enjoyment of our work shouldn't devolve into some kind of attempt to amass wealth, to, to fix what's wrong with this life and Solomon talks about a few ways in which wealth shows itself to be just a breath. A few things that I want us to consider this morning. And the first thing that he talks about is this human tendency that we have not to be satisfied with the things that we go after once we get them. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This also is vanity. This is an idea that he's returned to a few times in this book, that the eye is not full of seeing. The ear is not filled with hearing. The reading today begins and ends with this idea. Right, if we skip ahead to, to chapter 6, verse 7, we read, All the toil of man is for his mouth. Right, God, God gave us a built-in money pit right here in the middle of our face. All the toil of man is for his mouth, yet his appetite is not satisfied. For what advantage has the wise man over the fool? What does the poor man have who knows how to conduct himself before the living? Better is the sight of the eyes than the wandering of the appetite. This also is vanity and a striving after wind. The thing is that we will never be truly satisfied with wealth of any kind, whether we're talking money, or we're talking houses, livestock, children, Funko Pops, any of the... There's all kinds of things that people amass. And Solomon tells us we're never going to be satisfied with any of it. 
this is a lesson that should be intuitive to us. I mean, we can obviously understand it like in our heads, like, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, but I, I want us to try to wrap our, hand, our heads around just how strong this truth is in the real world. Who do you think of whenever you hear the word billionaire? All right, just whoever you think of, just have that person in your mind. I mean, we've got any number that we could be thinking of. But I want you to consider for a minute what it takes to make a billionaire. Let me, let me go back. I mean, we're going to do a short thought exercise. It's not going to make any sense at first, but it will in just a second. Uh, because I, I suspect that most people don't spend a lot of time thinking about the Norman invasion of 1066. <laughs> but you spend a lot of time speaking it because it's what introduced all of these Latin-rooted words into our language. That's how we ended up with, with French-sounding English. That happened not quite a thousand years ago, 1066. I want you to consider this, that if you had been alive for the Norman conquest of England and had made a million dollars every year since then, you would not be a billionaire today. All right, I, was, I think that's basic math that I think I got right. Right, a thousand millions takes a, it makes a billion, right? That's a long, long time ago, folks. I, I don't know what a million dollars looks like. Let alone a million dollars every single year for a thousand years. What would you, what? I don't know, maybe your imagination is stronger than mine. I don't even know what I would do with a million dollars every year for a thousand years. And yet, you think of the person I asked you to imagine earlier. Do you think that person's satisfied with the wealth that they have amassed? Do you think that they enjoy some kind of satisfaction in this life that you and I can't enjoy? They have wealth that, again, we just, the, the point of that thought exercise is we just, we can't really properly comprehend how wealthy some people get in this world. And yet not even that is sufficient to fill the craving that we have because everything that we get just creates more craving. All right, everything, everything works at scale, as it were. All right, the bigger your income gets, the bigger your appetite gets. And the bigger your appetite gets, the bigger your income needs to be. And that's not the only thing that scales up, according to Solomon. He says the second way in which wealth is vain is through the hangers-on that it attracts. When goods increase... They increase who eat them. And what advantage has their owner but to see them with his eyes? There's, this cuts a few different ways. Uh, we've got a slightly more modern proverb that speaks to this. The man with a full purse never lacks for friends. As you, as you grow in wealth, you'll find that there are more and more people who have more and more needs pressed against that wealth. That in other words, what you thought you were doing with that wealth turns out not to be the thing that you actually end up doing with that wealth. Or we could consider it another way. Again, that, that ventures naturally grow. They scale up. Right, that more money men, it means increased scale. And then in some sense, you can end up just kind of spinning your tires, growing but going nowhere. But this is something that, again, we're, we're all subject to. 
And it fits right in with this unlimited craving that we have. That no matter how big we scale things up, we're not satisfied with it. And the people that we attract aren't satisfied with it either. Right, we, get, we get mad whenever we look at, uh, at certain charts displayed on the news and the line is going down instead of going up. The line is always supposed to go up into eternity. Right? Don't those idiots in Washington know that? We turn into the onceler where we get out and we're just going to keep biggering and biggering and biggering, as he said. But, of course, we know what happens to him, if you're familiar with the story of the Lorax. Eventually, he runs out. But most of what Solomon spends his time on this morning is just the, the general futility that accompanies all wealth. <laughs> That money is not even really useful, or at least consistently useful, for the things that it's supposed to be useful for. We think, for example, of the rich man who can't sleep because of his indigestion. In verse 12, sweet is the sleep of a laborer, whether he eats little or much, but the full stomach of the rich will not let him sleep. We suppose that's the combination of overeating and worrying about the wealth that he has. But there are lots of ways for wealth to go wrong. He says, there's a grievous evil that I've seen under the sun. Right? And then he, he tells us this, uh, a comedy of errors. Riches were kept by their owner to his hurt. Right, we're to imagine this guy who has amassed some wealth and he is just well, perhaps unlucky, perhaps foolish. Who knows? Solomon doesn't, doesn't fill in the blanks here for us. But at the time at which he has his wealth, his possession of that wealth actually hurts him. Right? He's been hoarding it up, not using it. And at the time, it becomes a liability to him. Well, then, he decides, well, maybe we'll put some of this wealth to use. We're going we're gonna to make some investments, put the money to work instead of hoarding it up. Well, then what happens? The moment he's not hoarding it up, we read those riches were lost in a bad venture. Sometimes holding on to the money isn't any good. Sometimes putting the money to work isn't any good. And he is the father of a son, but he has nothing in his hand. On account of his bad luck or his folly or whatever it is with money, he ends up not even being able to leave anything behind to those after him. Not that that would count for much, because right? we've already read in other places how it turns out that maybe you do have something to leave behind, but your son is an idiot. And he just squanders it all. And this leads us to the recognition that it doesn't really matter anyway. As he came from his mother's womb, he shall go again, naked as he came, and he shall take nothing for his toil that he may carry away in his hand. Or finally, Solomon considers the, uh, the illustration of a man who has amassed all of this wealth, Possessions, honor, he's, he's a man in a high place. But he's not actually able to do anything with it, not able to enjoy what he has. And furthermore, somebody else is enjoying it. All of his wealth, all of his work, all of his prestige just goes to benefit somebody else. 
Solomon doesn't get specific with us here. Is it some kind of oppression? Is it thievery? Is it a bunch of bureaucratic red tape? Bad tax laws? What is it? He doesn't fill in those blanks for us because there, there's an infinite number of ways to fill in that blank. There have been rich men through all history whose wealth has gone to someone else against their will during their life. But in all of these ways, wealth is vain. It is a mere breath. Not only will it not do what it's intended for in this life, it's certainly not going to solve the bigger problem of the general meaninglessness, the futility, the, the breathiness of everything in this world. And so the call this morning is not to set your hope on these things. As we've said before, Solomon is working his way there. But he's first considering all of these things that we shouldn't place our hope in. One of the reasons why we assemble together every Lord's Day is because of the hope that we do share. Lasting and eternal hope. We have promises made to us that none of the things in this book can fulfill. You know, the, again, the wealth, uh, any of this stuff. We have the promise of eternal life. We have the promise of the forgiveness of sins. And we share that with you this morning. If you have found yourself looking out in the world for some satisfaction and have found none, we urge you this morning to turn to Jesus, the only place where you can find satisfaction. We urge you this morning to believe in the good news of Jesus, that he is the Son of God, who took on flesh and gave himself as a sacrifice for our sins, that he was raised on the third day, that he lives eternally at the right hand of the Father Almighty. We urge you to believe that good news and to turn away from the ways of this world, to confess Jesus to be the Christ, the Son of the living God, and to be baptized into his death, burial, and resurrection for the remission of your sins. If you're subject to that invitation, we urge you, make your need known by coming forward as together we stand and sing.